being black. You both seem to be very revolutionary women. You know, I believe it's high time our leaders of the fight against racial injustice and inequality had good hair color. <laughs> I love that. That I should be a requirement for Congress. It that works. should be a requirement right there. Hi everybody, my name is Alana. I'm here with Kimberly and Gilly Segal. I'm so excited to speak with them on behalf of Maryland Matters. They're getting ready to do an event for Maryland Humanities. And so I wanted to give a, a little chat with them. So happy Women's Month, ladies. <laughs> you, if you could just, you know, introduce yourselves to everybody and, and then we'll jump right into the questions. Cool. I'm Gilly Eagle, and with Kimberly Jones, I'm the co-author of I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, which was our debut young adult novel. I am Kimberly Jones. I am a co-author of I'm Not Dying With You Tonight and the forthcoming Why We Fly with Gilly Siegel. I always forget about that forthcoming one. <laughs> okay, forthcoming. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming to Maryland, virtually anyway, for a conversation with Maryland Humanities about your NAACP Image Award nominated book, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, inspired by the death of Baltimorean Freddie Gray. Much like the main characters, one of you is Black, obviously, and one of you is white. How important was that in balancing the narrative of the book? And like the promo of the book says, they aren't friends, they hardly understand each other's point of view. Has the chaos of this world thrown you both together in similar ways to the teen girls Lena and Campbell in the book? I would say yes. I think that story that inspired it definitely threw us together. Geely actually saw the story and this was her idea. And she was smart enough, cause she's a smart chickie, to know that telling the story of this lived experience that African-Americans have was not necessarily her story to tell. But as a mom, after she read this article about kids who were trapped in the midst of the civil unrest in Baltimore without direction, she felt compelled to process that as a writer. And so she came to my job at the time I was a, a bookseller. I was the store manager for Little Shop of Stories, a children's bookstore in Decatur, Georgia. And Geely and I were in a book club together. And we were friendly, but not like, you know, we didn't have each other's digits or whatever. You as know? the kids say. Yeah, as the kids say in 1995. <laughs> so she came into the store, stalked around, scared my staff. They thought I had a legit stalker. This is unfortunately the truth. I'm like, no, I know her. She's harmless. She's a lawyer. And so she started to run down her like bulleted list of why we should write this book. And I was like, if you had me at Let's Write Together. And so that's like our Jerry Maguire, also a reference the kids don't know, but um, our Jerry Maguire moment. And so to answer your question about it throwing us together, the interesting part is, even though this was inspired by what happened in Baltimore, so much continued to happen after that as we were on this process. Charlottesville happened and Trump happened and like all these things happened and we would find that like we would write things and then they would come to life. There's a scene in our book that we wrote prior to Charlottesville and then a similar incident happened in Charlottesville. And so we kind of knew that we were on the right track creatively, but what it did was being on this journey, writing this book, and just like this full journey of this from when we started writing in 2015 to now almost six years later, so much has happened that brought us closer together. We've had so many crying nights and so many situations happen in our personal lives and so many hard conversations. And then we've extended ourselves in the social justice arena. Geely got me involved with this organization, Invisible Hate, and like we've done talks and lectures we did, you know, like a diversity lecture at her company and like, it kind of forced us to become like, I don't want to say experts because I don't I don't want to like oversell it, but it forced us to really engage and pay attention and get knowledgeable about what was happening in the social justice realm because people wanted to hear from us. People wanted our yeah. opinion and we, did, we didn't want to do more harm than good in doing that. Gilly, do you have anything you want to add? As Kim mentioned, we were, although not close friends, we were friendly before we started writing this book together. And I actually think that's a key element of, of the book and of our relationship, right? Our relationship comes first. We, we are creative. We like each other. We, we, like we just like each other. Yeah. And we're creative business partners, but we're friends first and foremost. And as compared to the girls in the book who are not friends and, and really don't like each other or see each other's point of view, I don't know that 
we couldn't, certainly Kim has said in the past, um, not to steal her thunder, but we steal each other's best lives. Well, I just told a whole spill that she did, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I don't know how we could have written a book about race relations in America without having a relationship of trust, right? Because being able to come into this with the understanding that we love each other and that we would never do any harm intentionally to one another, it created a space where we could talk more honestly and less carefully, I think, than than in other scenarios. So I don't know how the characters do it, frankly. Maybe just the extreme atmosphere uh, enables them to talk more honestly with one another. Well, I love the I love the synergy you guys have. You have it, what seems to be a beautiful friendship. I I love that that womanhood, that camaraderie we have with each other. You both seem to be very revolutionary women. You know, I believe it's high time our leaders of the fight against racial injustice and inequality had good hair color. <laughs> I love that. That should would, be a requirement for Congress. That would. should be a requirement right there. You know, speaking of like Congress and, and state laws, did you know that like Black women are 1.5 times more likely to be sent home from the workplace because of their hair? So they passed this Crown Law Act and it's like against discrimination in the workplace, making any discrimination against your hair illegal. Like, how do you guys feel about stuff like that? Um, I'll let Geely answer that because she goes to a grown-up job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's crucial. It is sad to me that we need a law to do this, but I also understand why, right? This is one of those types of insidious, subtle ways that racism plays out that white people are very often sort of blinkered to, right? Is when a white person can do something that is a fashion choice versus a black person wearing their hair in a way that's natural for their hair and it's criticized, it's demeaned, causes them to be sent home. We use the words unprofessional a lot. Um, and it happens across the spectrum of black working people, right? From corporate workplace. Uh, I can also think of athletes who have been criticized. One of my favorite hockey players is a guy named JT Brown who has worn his hair uh, in rows before and and there was discussion on ESPN and like that's shocking to me because do we ever talk about Tom Brady's haircut on ESPN as a measure yeah. of his professionalism no we don't so I'm sad that we need legislation to address this but if legislation calls to white people's attention the insidious way that we demean and criticize black people for their natural hair, then I'm glad that we have passed it. I, I just agree with her. I have been fortunate and blessed that for the most part throughout the course of my life, I've worked in spaces where self-expression is accepted. You know, when I, I was a bookseller, no one's giving you a hard time about your hair in a bookstore. You know, most of my jobs have been, you know, creative jobs. I've worked, you know, for the ballet and, and TV and film and, and spaces where, you know, those criticisms just don't come up. But I'm aware that that happens. I, I think back to the young wrestler that went viral when and they, he had dreadlocks and they made him cut his hair off right before his meet. And he's standing there as they're cutting in his hair and he's crying. So when I think about things like that, this is why it's so, so, so very important that we do utilize legislation because people say, well, why do you need to legislate that? Well, you legislate that because humans just innately, some of them are just bad. You don't make them do the right thing. They just won't. I think that leans into the concept of liberty. Like I should be able to have my freedom. If someone is blocking my freedom, then my nation, my representatives should stand up for me and release that blockage. And your fellow citizens should too. The The story of that wrestler, I mean, I get teary-eyed whenever I think of it because I also go, where were his adults? Where were the white adults in the audience who should have stood up and said, I beg your pardon, take your hands off that child's hair. And that like makes you would have, <laughs> she would have caused a ruckus. <laughs> Are you a ruckus causer? I hope in that moment that I would have stood there and said, get your hands off that. That's a child in his hair. But like, where were the adults in that moment who have, you know, you have to think about the power dynamic, right? Like the people yeah. who have more privilege and more power must use it to stand in and say like, what are we doing? Yeah. This is wrong. I love that. Thanks for touching on that with me. I know that was like completely outside of your guys' scope, but I just loved your hair. And I was like, I wonder how they feel about the crown act. So I wanted to ask. Next question. Um, outside of I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, what are three books or videos or like whatever, whatever you want, you know, that you would add into a curriculum in the digital age about race? Um, how would you encourage that conversation? I would add it 
anything, and I do mean anything, by Tiffany Jackson. Okay. Anything written, allegedly, grown, you know, I, anything Tiffany Jackson, I would I would add to the to the canon. I would say Jason Reynolds, that big jerk face, but they already add him to everything. Yeah. <laughs> He's on a lot of lists. But yeah, I mean, certainly stamped from the beginning or stamped the, yep, the YA version. Um, anything Ibi's a boy, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I also, there's a really great YouTube series called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man by Emmanuel Ancho, which I think if you're more of a visual learner than a book learn, I, I think that's a really good series. He does a really great job and he talks about and tackles a lot of different issues related to race and race relations. So thanks for those. Thanks for those recommendations. I'm sure I'm going to look into those and I'm, I hope some of the people watching it do too. Kimberly, this is personal. Um, <laughs> I noticed your cousin Pat turned 65 via a post on Instagram stories. Um, yes. So happy birthday to cousin Pat. Um, Happy birthday, Pat. <laughs> a lot of people know Black people use the phrase Black don't crack when describing how Black women specifically are so darn graceful at aging. Um, we both know as Black women, and Gailey, you too as a woman, that we are all susceptible to cracking. Um, does Black crack to you guys? And does womanhood crack to you guys? Like, I feel like I have moments where I crack, like where I'm, you know, 30 minutes late for something and I just need a minute or something. So like, how do you guys feel about that, those statements? I just feel like <laughs> it's just hilarious to me how successful patriarchy is. It is successful. It is wildly successful. If it was a person, it would have like walls and walls and walls of cords. Mm. If it was a person, it would have billions, maybe even it would be the first trillionaire if it was a person. It would be like, it would have an entire garage of custom cars, classic cars in mint condition, one after another. That is how successful the patriarchy is. It is that. It is, there is no person on this planet, not Bezos, not any of them that are as successful as patriarchy is. And so it's one of those things where this omnipresent desire to place value in a woman on how she looks is one of the most brutal things that we introduce to young girls. It is even more a brutal thing that we introduce to young boys because I think as a mother, I have a son who's 14, almost 15, and I work overtime, overtime to combat that by conveying to my son, you want a woman of good character. You want a woman who's solid, who's going to hold you down. You want a woman who has her own intellectual, creative, and spiritual path. You do not want to choose your mate based on her ability to not crack. Beautifully said. Brava. I'm, I'm Jewish, but Kim takes me to church. You can see why I love her. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Um, I, like, I, I would like to be Jewish, especially during the Jewish holidays, because... Uh, I'm not gonna lie, the food's really good. If it's latkes, count me in. Like, <laughs> count me all the way in. Build me in. Put me in, coach. <laughs> My son, like, all he talks about is the one time he went to like a fancy dinner at Aunt Geely's house, and like, all he can he reminisces about the food as if though it was the greatest time of his life. <laughs> yes. Thank you for covering birthdays and and cousin Pat with me and patriarchy. I do agree patriarchy has like walls and a roof and a plumbing system. It's a fully built system house that everyone is living in. So um, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Tell me about the importance of caring for your mental health. You know, what is each of your practices to ground, um, especially as you're touring and revolutionizing the way the world thinks about race and having these conversations, especially with youth and young adults? I mean, your mental health is critical. It's first and foremost. It, it has to be, right? How can you help others if you are not helping yourself? But I, I think to, for me personally, what I try to remind myself is being strong doesn't mean 
never having moments where you need help, where you cry. I think we set up this binary of strength versus weakness. And it's like being strong means only one thing, but it doesn't. If you're having a hard day, if you need to be emotional, if you need to let that out, I think we need to be more generous about honoring that that's fine, especially like as a woman and a woman in the workplace. Like I, I think we assume that strong means traditionally, stereotypically, toxically male traits. And I'd like for us to step back from that because I need a break. I need to cry. I need to stress out. I have days where I look like Medusa with snakes coming out of my head. And then I come back. <laughs> and I think you got to have wonderful people around you who let you do that and who pick you up when you are down. But it's okay to be down. Like part of being strong is, is having moments of weakness. Kim, did you have anything you want to add about how you ground? I have this really weird thing that I do. <laughs> Let's see how weird. I guess it's, it's, the funny thing is it's not really weird, but I introduce it that way because how I came to it is weird. So that's why it's weird in my mind, not the process itself, but like how I came to it is weird. But anyway, I have these things that I call the nine tenets of, of life. And what I do is I keep a notebook. Do I have my purse? No, I always keep a notebook and I will periodically write down my nine tenets of life and write where I'm at in each tenant. And if I'm light or empty somewhere, I occupy my time and try to create more balance in my life by filling in space in those tenants. And so the nine tenants are career, home, transportation, relationships, finances, health and beauty, hobby, education, and community. And so you can view them however you want to view them. Education doesn't have to be you go back to school. Education can mean you take a master class or you sign up for a, a writing workshop or you, you know, you, you, you pick up sewing and you sign up for the, like at the local, at, I would say community center. What, why do I think it's 85 and I'm like going to dance with turbo as electric boogaloo or something, but, um, turbo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I I keep notebooks with these nine tenants, and so sometimes I'll go through them, and I'll be like, I need to balance out life. I need to find something for me. Something is missing. I'm feeling whole, and I'll be like, Oh, I have nothing in the education slot right now. I'm gonna sign up for. Uh, I'm gonna go order master class, or I'm gonna w go watch some YouTube videos on revisions, or or you know, it may be something missing in community, and I'm like, Oh man, I haven't done you know. Now that's not the case. I do community stuff all the time. But back in the day, it would be like, oh, I'm not, I don't have anything in community. Let me sign up to be a March leader for the March of Dimes, this, the walk, or whatever the case may be to keep that balance. Because the other thing that it does is I only allow myself to really have like one thing in each slot. So on the, on the flip side of that, if I do those nine tenants and I've got four or five things going in each slot, I'm like, oh, this is why I'm feeling overwhelmed. Let me take account and see which of these things I can wrap out. Oh, this is so brilliant, by the way. What I love about this so very much is it gets at the heart of, I think, what is wrong when we talk about work-life balance. When we talk about work-life balance, we have this presumption that balance means things are equal, but that is not life. I mean, it's much more like when you're cooking dinner on a stove with six burners, right? You can't have all six burners going on high or you're going to burn something or it's going to boil over. So it's like when I'm working on this dish, I turn the burner up on that and I turn the burner down on the rice in the back because it's just it's just warming now yeah. and that is what you have to do in your life too right it's like I've got the community burner turned up really high right now that might mean that the hobby burner is turned down low and I'll get back to that later but it's that I love that because it so brilliantly encapsulates the notion that balance is something that ebbs and flows mm -hmm. oh, I love it yeah I love that um <laughs> speaking of just mental health and healing Kim, I saw an event on your Instagram that said Revolutionary Healing coming up on March 21st. Could you yeah. tell folks a little bit about that? So Revolutionary Healing is a, a one-day healing retreat that I started with some friends. Um, well, I can't say I started. My friends started and I jumped on board with it. Um, that me and some friends started back in September. We do it every third Sunday of the month. We realized that after the civil unrest, after dealing with COVID, after dealing with all of these things, we're having all these revolutionary conversations about 
legislation and reparations and self-identifying and grappling with implicit bias and all of this. But to us, no one was talking about healing. No one was talking about the mental health of people of color. And so my, my dear friend, Yanajaha Lone Wolf, came up with this idea and she said, I want to do this event. And she gathered, you know, a, a, a small group of our friends. It was me and her and Char Bates and Chris Brown, all, you know, national organizers. And she was like, I want to start this thing called Yanajaha and Friends Presents Revolutionary Healing. And I want to tackle getting people to feel better because no one is thinking about how to get people to feel better. And so we created revolutionary healing and I, I refer to it as like Kanye's Sunday service on steroids. Um, <laughs> and we do it every third Sunday of the month and we have healing classes. We have like meditation and yoga and horseback riding and zip lining and it changes mm -hmm. every month we do it in a different location every month. Um, we always do it like in a national park or somewhere like that where there's lots of green and rivers and things like that. And for the most part, we try to keep it free to the public. If there's something that, that costs additional things, we'll say, okay, it's free, but if you want to go horseback riding, there's a fee for that. It's free, but if you can go zip lining, there's a, there's a fee for that. But it's a full day retreat. It starts um, at 1 p. It goes, well, not full day, but it, it, it starts at noon and goes until 5 p.m. every third Sunday of the month. And everyone's welcome, but we do encourage mostly African American and Native American people to come. We have a, a very large African American and Native American uh, group that comes out. And the day before, we do that every third Sunday of the month, but every third Saturday of the month, we offer by invite only sweat lodge. Um, with one of our native brothers, Keese. He does a sweat lodge the day before, and then the next day we do revolutionary healing. And so we just found that like, it's so good for people. People who can't afford to get these type of services. We have therapists, we rotate what the workshops and classes are, and we've had so many different things. And we do a griot every month, which is like an elder that comes and speaks um, from a space of wisdom. And we have performers and we have a tea company that comes and make a special tea that's free to the people every month. We have gift bag giveaways that we give to people that they can take away some of the things that they do. And we just felt like the most revolutionary thing you can do right now is self-improvement. Wonderful. Well, I hope anyone watching, including myself, looks a little bit further into revolutionary healing. I wanted to kind of jump back a little bit. You said something about civil unrest and one of the big questions last year for a lot of people um, especially white folks was like, how can I be a good ally to everything that's happening? Um, and so, Healy, I wanted to ask you, you know, what are some things, because Kim already kind of sung your praises, you know, <laughs> saying that when, you know, you were thinking of writing this book, you, you reached out to her because it's not quite your story to tell. So, you know, what are some things that people can do in order to be a good ally? Oh, that's such a great question. I, I love that question. I, I love that you're asking me too, because I think one of the key things that we can do, we, so racism is a white problem um, that white people need to solve. It is not a black problem that white people need to empathize with. So the first thing is taking accountability for recognizing that we should turn to each other and say like, hey, what, what are we doing? What, what must we do? I, I think I probably have like a top three. The first one is listen. Listen really hard to the community that you are seeking to be an ally to and amplify their voices. Too often we want to step in, we want to be leaders, and it comes from a good place, but what you're doing is you're stepping all over the community that you're trying to help. Um, and so you should be listening first and you should be amplifying their efforts by asking what do they need and what do they want. Another one I would say is being an ally is a journey. It's not a destination. I, I really hate, I dislike using the word woke like as, a, as applied to allies because I think we tend to use it like as a badge of honor and we're like stamping ourselves like I'm woke now and I know all the stuff, but it's a journey, right? You are always right. learning. You're always learning more about what someone's lived experience is that's different from yours. And so view it as a journey and not as something that you like stamp yourself with. And also remember that you don't get to decide whether or not you are an ally, the community are seeking to support decides for you and you have to earn it all the time so when I meet you know Kim, Kim knows me and knows my heart and we've been on this journey together for a long time but when I meet a new person who, from, who is African-American they get to decide how they feel about my efforts and, and whether I'm an ally yet or not right um, and I I'm a, like the, it's not for me to be okay or not okay with that it is that it just is right and we like I don't get to feel any kind of way about that 
Um, and then the last one is I really, particularly in March of 2021, after the year that we have all been through, I want to encourage us to move past ally and into accomplice. Oh. So al to, me, <laughs> to me, an ally is someone who's like, right on, I support you. Whereas an accomplice is someone who is willing to risk something personal, sacrifice something personal to actually create change. And we all have different ways that we could risk or sacrifice something personal. It might mean, um, like in, in the author world, if you are a white author who's being invited to panels and you look and you see the panel you've been invited to be on is entirely white, stepping back and saying, my policy is I will not sit on a panel that is all white male, um, use my space, not add somebody, but I, I'm not going to be on this panel. You go, here's a list of people that you might consider. It might be in your workspace, um, looking around the meeting table and saying, who's not here that should be here? Whose voices are we not listening to? Or when voices are in the room, amplifying the voices that are typically silenced. So I, in 2021, especially, my thing is like, it's time to move fast being allies, especially those of us who've been on this journey for a little while and become accomplices. I need me a couple of accomplices. I love that. I love that transition into that terminology. I'm, put, I'm putting that on my Instagram tonight. Yeah, <laughs> like your accomplices in the jail cell with you because they risked something actual, real life. And it's different for everybody. But like, if you're not willing to risk it, it's time. It's, it's time. time. As a Black woman myself, I'm very familiar with people not hearing me until I'm angry, um, like my kids or my man, who I don't have yet, but I'm just going to speak into existence. Kimberly, I felt so many parts of your viral video known widely as How Can We Win? Almost a year yep. since it dropped, I'm reminded of a text from the important work of Audre Lorde entitled The Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism, where she says, I have lived with that anger, ignoring it, feeding upon it, learning it, use it before and laid my visions to waste for most of my life. Once I did it in silence, afraid of the weight, my fear of anger taught me nothing. Your fear that anger will teach you nothing. And then she also says, the anger of women can transform difference through insight into power. And I really love that one. Because it's like real, like in that video, you were just so passionate. And we all know what people say about black women and their anger. Screw all that. I think what you used in that in that tool, like you turned it into like this insight and it really turned into something powerful. How do both of those and this goes for for either one of you, how do both of those excerpts make you feel and how can you relate to that text? Because anger is not just exclusive to Black women and that passion is not just exclusive to Black women, but it's something we saw in that video. Yeah, it's funny because that's like, not exactly, but very close to one of the themes in our new book of Why We Fly is like how the world responds to strong women. You know, and, and just like the anger, you know, you get the B word attached to you and things like that. It's like, it, it, it's as if though, people are insulted by you having a strong opinion and willing to be able to fight for it. Also because I'm older and wiser, I don't allow that to penetrate me in the way that I probably would have in my younger years. I, in my younger years, I probably would have been offended. I would have been hurt. I probably would have self-adjusted um, in order to fit a more like pleasant pleasing narrative to the people around me who were saying that all it did for me when people only referenced me as an angry black woman it was like an instant alarm clock that will go off and say don't like your voice don't like your voice don't like your voice because if you could listen to my cry which is really what it was and all you heard was anger that means you were consciously choosing to not listen to understand mm -hmm. and so because of that it just made me say then i choose to consciously not try to understand you i'm old i have no time <laughs> no time no time kim has no, no time, time folks no time. no time for shenanigans gilly do you have anything to add I think that notion, that use of angry black woman or angry woman or the B word, I mean, it's just another tool to maintain the status quo. Because what you're really saying is the way you're saying it is the problem. But what about what she's actually saying? It's just a tool. And it happens every time that the African American community raises its voice, whether it's angry black person or protest, protest, but don't block the streets 
protest, but don't take a knee. Protest, but it's, it's just another way of silencing people. And yeah. I think we have to be honest about that, right? It's like the, the, the veil is off now and we can all see if you couldn't already, I would argue you probably should have, but like there are real <laughs> problems here that this community is crying out to be fixed. And yeah. if you're still worried about tone, like you're part of the problem. Period. <laughs> Period. Um, <laughs> I know that it's Women's History Month. So, you know, why is it so important that women specifically, I know, but maybe some of the folks watching don't know, have a hand in the healing of our troubled nation? Like, what makes us equipped? Why women? I'm a cancer survivor, right? Mm -hmm. And that does not in any way, shape, form, or fashion make me an oncologist. However, it does make me an expert on how to properly receive the information from the oncologist. And so I think that that is the thing is that women as a collective have been marginalized since the first day some man bonked us over the head in a cave, right? Well, I don't know if we were really cave dwellers. I don't believe in that theory, but you know what I mean? And so because of that, it makes women experts and how to receive repair and so i think that if you want to talk, males as a as a whole even if they are marginalized males have benefited from male privilege literally since the dawn of time and so they cannot leave the charge on how to repair a broken nation when they broke it yeah that's so true. Also, like, listen, history, life happens to us too. That sounds like a silly thing to say, but there's um, a, a general, a, a woman general from the U.S. Army, I'm going to forget her name, and I apologize for that, but she's she was quoted when asked about whether women should be permitted to be soldiers in combat or not, and she said, women have always been in war as the victims, so why not let them have a hand in being participants with agency for a change? And I think that about everything, right? Like, this is going to happen to women, too. We have agency. We should be part of the power structures. I agree. I think we, I think we really are intuitive in that way, and I think it's just something men just don't possess, and, and they don't really feel the things and are able to process the things that we that we do and kind of regurgitate it and, and make it sound as beautiful. I mean, we're so eloquent, so graceful. I could go on and on about women. It's just such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. well, and, the, and the research shows it, right? Like if you look at the research that's done about corporations and the effectiveness of teams, you can't argue with the data, teams which have both men and women on them are significantly more effective, more productive, uh, more efficient than the others. Yeah. So whether you, you like it or not, the proof is in the results. The proof is in the pudding, people. I have just a couple more questions and then I'll let you guys go. Out of all the women in history, which ones are super inspiring to you? But then the second part of this question is, could you see that woman as like a TikTok or YouTube sensation, what would her channel be about? I love this question. <laughs> I love it so much. Okay, I've got two. They're inspiring to me for a similar reason, right? So the first one is actually my own grandmother, my dad's mother. She grew up in Philadelphia. She was the national president of ORT. She was an educator in Philadelphia and she created like revolutionary programs to help students in Philadelphia complete school. And she was like the breadwinner and the leader in the family. Like she was the dominant personality in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when like that, what like it was less traditional. So she she was like this this strong woman and she raised my dad who I think is one of the greatest ally for women that I've ever met in my life like he raised two strong daughters and there was never a gender there was never gender-based assumption in my house and so like I am inspired by her for living outside of the norm and raising a man who was able to do that which I think is no small feat and then the other one oddly enough is Hedy Lamar, the actress mm. um, yeah so she Hedy Lamar was we all know who she is she's like this Hollywood bombshell she was Jewish and she was 
was a refugee from Nazi controlled Austria. She got out of a really bad marriage where her husband like basically locked her. I mean, it was in a castle, but he like locked her up. And then she came to Hollywood and she did so many things. She was this bombshell actress. She was a producer, but she also invented technology. Like she is responsible for inventing the technology that today powers Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And at the time she invented it as like a navigation system for naval warships and the Navy like laughed her out of the room because she was this beautiful woman. Yeah. But what I really love is she encompassed so many beautiful, wonderful traits, none of which fit into the neat box that anybody tried to put her in. And I am inspired by someone who lives outside of all boundaries. I'd watch her TikTok videos. And she would go, my grandma on TikTok, I don't, I would not permit that to, that would be <laughs> bitch, but I'd watch some Eddie Lamar. Right. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to follow suit with Geely. My first person that I'm mostly inspired by is my mama, Lula Jones Holt. I'm actually writing a, a novel for Henry Holt loosely based on her life. My mother programmed robots that delivered the mail in the Sears Tower in 1976. Wow. Um, yeah. Computer work. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, she was a she was a pioneer in tech. Um, she worked with with Xerox engineers, but she both programmed the robots and oversaw the installation of them and then trained the workers on how to on how to use them. And she overcame a lot. Like I she I gave her a recorder and I've been listening to her recordings. And her story is so similar in the way in which she was treated to um hidden figures. Um she had to use a different bathroom and like all these weird things that that she had to endure and, and just like the mean nature things that people did to her um on this journey and so i i would i, I would tiktok she would my mom is not no one would tune into her channel um <laughs> i love her but she would not and, and she wouldn't want to right she'd be like i'm right. not tiktok i'm not doing that get out of there just shenanigans although she still to this day she's about to be 75 and she still loves tech my mom has every gadget she has alexis she had alexa like i can't even say it right she has alexa she has recorders she has yeah. you know, she's an iphone she's just like she's still hip to it you know what i mean she still loves technology um the second person and i would definitely definitely i don't know about her tiktok but her ig would be so lit and that is stagecoach mary she was one of the first female mail carriers at a time when mail carrying was very similar to uber um you were an independent contractor you had to have your own stagecoach in order to do it but she became infamous because many many mail carriers were robbed um during that time that's one of the things that bandits did but was robbed because people would send money in the mail and stuff like that back then she never lost any mail on her route because she was known for having a 12 gauge shotgun and she would pick you off if you tried to rob her stagecoach. And they made a law in her state. I think she was from Oregon. You may have to fact check me on that because that may not be right. But whatever, Montana, she's from Montana. The state that she was in banned women from being in saloons, from drinking. And she loved whiskey. It was known that she loved whiskey. The law, it's on the, it was on the law books. Like you can pull it up and look at it. There was a small amendment in that law that said women could not drink in saloons except for Mary Fields. So they put a clause in the law that said women can't drink in saloons except for Mary Fields can drink wherever she wants to. That's bad. Love that. That's, that is hardcore. That's hardcore. I really love that. I, I love, love that too. These are all women who were like, oh, you want me to live that way? No, 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 no. I think I'm going to live this way. I'm yeah. just gonna, I don't need your I permission. I for you. Yeah. yeah. I, so yeah. imagine her Instagram or her TikTok is just full of her like at bars drinking whiskey with her shotgun. Her shotgun. Her shotgun her like oh, she'd be like from her ride like oh bandit. Yeah. Her stage <laughs> coach parked outside. She's like she and really they, is like an Insta star. And they better not touch that wagon while she's in there drinking either. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading something recently where I was like, they referred to um, drinking as bending elbows because when you're at the bar, you're like always bending oh. your, and I was like, what? Okay, cute. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Love it. Make it come. Like Let's bring it, it back. I Let's like bring that. it back. 
we're going to wrap it up. I really have enjoyed talking to you both. I definitely know you have some stuff coming up, some books. I know there's an event coming up with Maryland Humanity. Shout out to them for even introducing me to you guys. This has been awesome. <laughs> that event is coming up and it's called Why It Matters, Reckoning with Race, Equity, and Allyship. And I'm excited for it. I'm excited to tune in. But, you know, what else is coming up? Tell us the name of the book again and where folks can follow you. Uh, our first book is called I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. It is available really wherever books are sold. Your local indie is always a great one. Mm -hmm. um, and in Baltimore, you have a wonderful, it's called Blue Ivy, right? You have a wonderful indie bookshop. Yep. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. You get it from Blue Ivy right there in Baltimore. Um, or, you know, any of your, your sort of online retailers. And as Kim said, she's so much better at this than I am. But we do have a second book that should be released in October of this year. Actually, stay tuned to one of our Instagram or Twitters because the cover will drop on Monday. Ooh, okay. Cover drop. <laughs> Shout out to the Kim's got more too. Wait, Kim's got a book coming out in September of next year. November. I just found out it got moved. Oh, it's so, November. Okay, November. November, uh, November um, called, um, uh, what is it called? How We Can Win. How We Can Win. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's adult nonfiction. It is an extension of my viral video. I love an extension. I love I love the vibes. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for that. Everybody look forward to both of those books. You guys have a forthcoming book together. Mm -hmm. And yes. Kim has a book. Gilly, you're writing, not in cafes. Oh, and right. we, also, we also have a short story in an anthology, but we just don't know when it's I don't know when that's going to be. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And I'm writing, and I'll sell another book someday. Hopefully. <laughs> we, also, also, we also sold our film rights for I'm Not Dying With You. Oh, now. yes. Okay. Okay, yeah. film. I'm with it. Netflix. Okay. We're speaking that into the universe. Yes, like movie, movie get made, film get made. We're like, come on. Movie get made, film get made, okay? <laughs> I love